the personal YouTube channel of Cristiano Ronaldo has set a record. ESPN reported on this. The wait is over. My YouTube channel is finally here. Subscribe and join me on this new journey, Ronaldo posted on his social media accounts. A couple of hours after posting his first video, 1.69 million subscribers had joined the newly launched digital channel. The channel collected more than 14 million subscribers in 17 hours. This rapid growth underscores just how massive Ronaldo's influence is, particularly among younger audiences that have grown up in the era of social media and online content creation. It signals that athlete is savvy to the power of the creator economy and is determined to harness it for his own brand and legacy. Ronaldo has 112.5 million followers on the X platform, 170 million on Facebook and 636 million on Instagram. The former Real Madrid and Manchester United player is preparing for his team's Saudi Pro League opener against Al Raid. On the channel, Ronaldo has promised to give fans an unprecedented look into his life, sharing content not just about football but also about his family, wellness, nutrition, preparation, recovery, education, and business. I have always enjoyed having such a strong relationship with fans on social media and my YouTube channel will give me an even bigger platform to do so and they will learn more about me, my family, and my views on many different subjects," Ronaldo said in the channel's launch announcement. Marketing reason or not, the Portuguese star opens a new window for his personal brand to expand beyond the pitch. He will have a team in charge of the channel but he will make the decisions and the direction of the content he uploads on YouTube. Russian troops defending territory in the Kursk region, sandwiched between the Seam River and the border with Ukraine, risk being encircled after Ukraine destroyed bridges that are their only route for resupply or retreat, the New York Times reports. The bombing of the bridges is aimed at the area between the Seam River the border and the territory inside Russia already controlled by Ukraine with the aim of trapping Russian troops stationed there. According to statements by the Ukrainian Air Force and reports by Russian officials and military commentators on social media, there are three bridges across this section of the river, all of which are now destroyed or damaged, the newspaper writes. As the New York Times notes, it is unknown how many Russian soldiers remain in the area between the Seam River and the border with Ukraine. This territory includes the town of Glushkovo, which had a population of about 5,000 before the invasion and is seen as a likely next target for the Ukrainian armed forces after the capture of Sudza. As Nikolai Beleskov, a military analyst with the Comeback Alive Foundation notes, attacks on bridges make it difficult or even impossible for the enemy to support its forces south of the Seam River and this could force Russian troops to retreat from the area. At the same time, according to him, if the Ukrainian armed forces advance to the river bank, they will gain the advantage of a natural barrier against any Russian counter-attack. According to military historian Vasily Pavlov, the Ukrainian strategy of using rivers as a defense becomes clear as the offensive progresses. Ukrainian forces advanced along two rivers, the Seam and the Psel, in each case using the waterway as a natural barrier to prevent counterattacks. As the New York Times notes, although Ukraine's ultimate military goals are unknown, if the Ukrainian armed forces advance deep into Russian territory, they could bring key rail junctions within artillery range. Ukrainian and Russian military commentators also point to Ukrainian bombing of the Russian town of Tetkino, located on the southern edge of the area where Russian troops could be trapped. This would put even more pressure on Russian forces in the area. The Ukrainian offensive in Kursk region succeeded thanks to electronic warfare blitz that blinded Russian reconnaissance drones. Russia responds with drones immune to jamming. As Forbes writes, this is the first time such a weapon has been used on the battlefield and also a kind of warning for most countries that rely heavily on jamming to protect themselves from terrorist drone attacks. FPV drones need radio communication with the operator. So on the front line, you can see many jammers that knock out radio noise on selected frequencies. Effective electronic warfare means 
create a safe bubble in the region of 50 to 100 meters, so UAVs constantly change operating frequencies and the jammers themselves are updated. That's why a blitz attack like Kursk is needed with a long lead time to detect all frequencies and enough jamming to block everything in the area and stop all drones for a while, the journalists explain. Radio communication requires line of sight and during the attack itself, the drones dive quite low, so at the last second, interference appears in the video signal which impairs visibility. One solution to the jamming problem is terminal guidance using artificial intelligence. The operator locks on a target at a certain distance and the drone pursues it even if communication is lost. These systems are already being deployed in small numbers by both sides. Another approach is wire guidance. The drone reels in a fiber optic cable as it moves, similar to wire guided missiles like the TOW, the article says. Ukraine recorded a Russian prototype of a fiber optic drone back in March and recently Russian telegram channels showed footage of the use of Prince Vandal Novgorodsky drones in the Kursk region. They are said to be immune to electronic warfare. Forbes previously reported that the German company HiCat is testing the HCX drone in Ukraine, which is resistant to radio frequency jamming and detection because it communicates with the operator via fiber optic cable. Back in March, Ukrainian developers announced the appearance of a fiber optic FPV drone called Banderik Strichka, 